The climate transition is anticipated to mitigate long-term welfare losses that would occur without intervention. However, short- and medium-term monetary costs are expected to arise during the transition. Mark Lorbey and Craig Penn question GDP. Is it the best indicator to correctly capture the monetary effects? How can the non-monetary aspects of the transition be measured? My name is Mark Lorbey and I'm with Craig Penn and we'll talk about the climate transition, measuring its cost and overall effects on well-being. And this has been uh, prepared also with the help of uh, Didier Blanchet. So the, the climate transition will have uh, long-term effects, but also immediate costs that must be borne by the population. The ultimate goal of the transition is to avoid the future costs that would arise from climate inaction, namely the climate change impacts. However, there will be some immediate short-term effects on household well-being occurring through monetary channels, mostly cost, carbon taxes, income losses, but also non-monetary dimensions, sometimes benefits in the domains of health or, or leisure, for instance. And so two different questions arise from this. First, will our usual monetary indicators correctly capture the monetary effects? And second, how can the non-monetary aspects of the transition be measured? So we'll, treat, we'll, we'll deal with these two uh, questions in turn. And so uh, I will uh, leave it to you, Craig, to address the first question. Yes, uh, thank you, Mark. And uh, hello, everyone. So yes, let's start with the monetary effects of the transition. So first of all, um, we can distinguish two different kinds of monetary effects, um, effects on stocks and effects on flows. Um, so the stock effects, the stock variations are recorded in what we call capital accounts um, and the transition uh, may have uh, some negative effects on um, asset values. So um, one uh, famous uh, example is the idea of stranded assets. Uh, so the fact that uh, some companies um, or even households uh, possess uh, assets that are polluting and that will lose value in the future because um, they would be too polluting to be used uh, in the future. And uh, in fact, these stock variations can sometimes be translated into flow variations. For instance, if uh, companies have to increase uh, their cost productions, which could uh, translate into uh, price, uh, price increases. And so this is the first kind of uh, effect. And the second kind, which we will mostly talk about in this talk, is uh, flow variations, so uh, which corresponds to variations in income uh, and prices. And this is recorded in uh, real GDP and uh, other uh, close indicators, such as uh, famous uh, purchasing power. Um, so what kind of uh, flow variations can we expect? Um, so variations of prices through, for instance, uh, carbon taxation, so uh, public policies uh, which could tax polluting goods, uh, but also regulation uh, that could affect production costs and increase prices. And uh, on the good side, um, technical progress, uh, which might help reduce prices of um, green substitutes. So the question that we'll answer in this first um, section is, can we still trust the messages of real GDP um, in the context of the climate transition? So first of all, What's uh, real GDP? Um, maybe put simply, it's uh, basically the evolution. It traces the evolution of income, but by adjusting this evolution for the change in prices. Because for instance, if my income increases at some rate, but the prices increase at the same rate, it's as if nothing has changed. Um, and this is what, this, this is close to the idea of purchasing power. And there is a usual connection in a simple framework uh, between um, purchasing power and what we can call monetary well-being. So the mon monetary component of uh, the individual's well-being. And uh, so put very simply in a simple framework, if we assume that people have preferences over market co commodities uh, that we represent with the function U, uh, then real GDP 
will approximate the evolution of you, not, of course, the evolution of the total well-being, which also depends on non-monetary uh, dimensions that are called uh, Z here. And so this, um, so real G GDP traces the evolution of you in some intuitive way, uh, which is that the growth rate of real GDP is equal to the growth rate of all the quantities Q when they all grow at the same rhythm. So for instance, if I consume twice as more uh, of everything, then my real GDP uh, is going to uh, increase by two. So this is uh, a connection, a link that exists under certain assumptions. Um, and what we'll show and talk about in the next slide is that in uh, the context of a greening economy and a climate transition, there may be some issues that could disrupt uh, this connection. So the first issue that we'll talk about is uh, consumption constraints. So uh, meaning when there are regulation policies uh, that constrain the consumption possibilities for households. For instance, if uh, the state decides to ban fossil fuel cars, um, then this uh, would probably be perceived as a cost, as a monetary cost by households because they have to uh, buy more expensive substitutes, green substitutes. However, um, since this is a regulation policy and not some, for instance, taxation policy, there's no price signal. And real GDP will not see uh, that this is um, lived, perceived as a cost by households. And so um, we, we show, uh, without going into detail here, but we show that we can actually try to estimate um, this bias the, that is missed by real GDP by finding uh, some uh, virtual price, uh, which would lead to the same consumption um, uh, than the regulation policy. So the equivalent taxation, basically, uh, that would lead to the same consumption changes uh, uh, that the um, regulation policy does. So this is the first issue. The second issue uh, is a bit um, made more uh, complex. So it's the idea of changing preferences. So historically, we, I mean, we all know that preferences change over time, um, but uh, we usually do as if uh, it was not the case and that preferences were stable. And we measure growth uh, as if preferences were stable and we need this assumption of stability to have an easy connection between uh, monetary well-being and real GDP as uh, I've talked about earlier. Um, however, this question of changes in preferences uh, has uh, risen recently, for instance, with the COVID crisis, where people uh, suddenly started to change their uh, behavior because they had to buy more of certain necessities and started, and they started um, stopping uh, doing other uh, kind of activities because of uh, the quarantine and, and so on. And uh, when it comes to greening preferences, the issue might be even uh, more problematic because we actually count on these changes to attenuate the costs of the transition and make it um, more acceptable uh, for the population. And so in this context, we at least want to know uh, how we can interpret uh, the standard indicators and whether or not we can find better indicators to handle the question of unstable preferences. So just to give you an example of, of what might be the issue with our current indicators, let's take a very simple um, situation with a, a tax on uh, brown goods. Uh, let's say a tax on um, fossil fuel cars, for instance, that we implement uh, progressively so that it, it increases more and more over time. So, Let's first consider the case of stable preferences. In this case, uh, it's clear that the impact of the tax is going to be negative on uh, monetary well-being and so on well-being in general. With greening preferences, uh, let's assume that consumers become uh, more and more disinterested uh, in the brown good. Then the decrease in well-being might be considered less significant because they care less about the brown good uh, on which there is a tax. So 
what will our indicators, uh, our standard indicators say uh, in such a context? Well, in fact, it depends on the timing of uh, the change in preferences. Let's say that the preference change is before the um, tax uh, is implemented, then there will be zero or little effects um, on real income because from the start of the taxation, people were, were already not buying much or not at all quantities of the ground goods. If it happens after the tax, however, the, the message will be the opposite because people were still buying a lot of the brown goods before the tax. And so the, the effect of the tax is bad on the budget, on the purchasing power of the, of the um, households. And once the preference change occurs afterwards, then it's invisible to the eye of the indicator because uh, the quantities are already very low. And the in-between situation is when the preference change and the tax happen at the same time, then the message will be in between, uh, so dampened, but uh, not completely um, invisible. And so the, the key message here is that the message of our indicators is going to depend on uh, the timing of the change in preferences. And this is what we call an issue of path dependence. And uh, conceptually, this may be seen as an issue because what we can see is that in the three different cases uh, of preference changes, the situation in the end is in fact the exact same. They have the same preferences and the prices are the exact same, yet the indicators have three different messages. And um, this is something that we usually don't want our um, national statistics to have as a property path dependence. Uh, so we'll, Mark will talk later about how to um, deal with uh, this issue. But uh, before that, uh, I will talk about the last issue before giving back um, uh, the microphone to Mark. The issue three is measuring beyond the mean. So we know how to uh, disaggregate the evolution of GDP. Um, but what this does is basically it uh, disaggregates the evolution of uh, each household, each decile's nominal incomes. Um, and then they deflate this income uh, by the same uh, price index. So they adjust the same way the incomes uh, with the change in prices. But the, um, there's been recent literature on what we call inflation inequality. And it's the fact that um, the consumption behavior of consumers depends on their um, income level. And um, some categories of households will be more exposed than others to price changes because they consume relatively more of certain goods. And typically, one example is energy expenditures. Um, as a proportion to their global income, poor, poorer households consume more energy than uh, richer, richer households. So if there's a price increase in energy, the um, poor or poorer households will be more impacted. And this is missed if we use a common deflator for all households. Um, and there are some other questions, uh, for instance, about savings. Should we um, apply price indices to nominal income or only to the portion of the income that is consumed because the rest is put into savings and is not directly um, influenced uh, by the price increase uh, in the current uh, period. Um, one answer to this is that uh, savings in the end will be consumed, so they will be in the end uh, be impacted by the, by the price increase. Uh, but if this price increase is not meant to last forever, for instance, uh, then the answer is uh, might not be so uh, so clear. And now I will give back the uh, the hand to Mark. Yeah, thank you, Craig. So let me now talk about the second question, which was about the measurement of the non-monetary uh, dimensions of the transition. So uh, the list of non-monetary effects is potentially long. Uh, we already uh, talked about positive effects on health, for instance, due to the reduction of air pollution, maybe on leisure, if there is a reorganization of the economy giving more time to people, 
However, uh, not all non-monetary non effects will be positive. Uh, there might be uh, career disruptions, for instance, so people will have well-being costs in their job transitions, in addition to their income effects, even if they don't go through a, a period of unemployment. And in the case of unemployment, there is a non-monetary effect in terms of loss of social status that needs to be clearly distinguished from the valuation of the leisure uh, that people may, may have. Um, and, and there are other uh, possible negative effects, for instance, housing densification with new urban planning may also um, affect uh, people's well-being more or less directly. And in addition, uh, many uh, other non-monetary effects are long-term and global. For instance, people may be affected by the evolution of biodiversity. So how should we measure these non-monetary effects and how can we combine them with the, the other effects, the monetary effects? So one solution is to use dashboards or description of the various dimensions one after the other in a separate way. Uh, such dashboards come with the problem that they provide a lot of information, uh, too much potentially, and this information is not properly or hierarchically organized. Another approach is to try to synthesize the information. And here uh, there are actually uh, three main uh, ways of doing that. You have composite indices, you have subjective well-being measures, and you have an explicit monetization of non-monetary dimensions, in particular with the concept of equivalent income. So let's review uh, briefly all these uh, methods. So here is an example of a dashboard, um, which is uh, describing the effects of demand-side options on well-being in the transition. So reduction in in demand in certain um, uh, environmentally problematic goods and an increase in more environmentally friendly uh, goods. And these are described in 19 different categories, um, which are related, uh, most of them, with the sustainable development goals of the, of the UN. Um, and on the, on the rows of the table, you have uh, the various uh, domains in which action can be done and changes in, in demand side uh, uh, phenomena can, can occur. Um, so this is a big table. Let's focus on one corner of this table uh, to have a, a way of looking at it more closely. So if you look at the columns here, you have the uh, domains in which you have effects, so like food, water, air, health, sanitation, energy, shelter, mobility, education. Okay, And in the rows, you have uh, what happens in the domains of buildings, in the domain of food. And in the table, in the cells of the table, you have the colors describing whether the effects will be good for the various uh, categories in the in the columns. Uh, when, when it's good, it's in blue. Dark blue is even better. And when it's uh, not blue, uh, yellow or, or red, then it's, uh, it's negative. And in addition, you have uh, even more information because you have stars giving you the degree of confidence with which uh, these evaluations are made. So you see a lot of information. And when you see uh, such a large table, um, it may be hard to uh, to figure out exactly what that means uh, overall. So let's look at uh, various ways of uh, synthesizing this complex information. So composite indices are um, things which aggregate different dimensions that uh, may belong to very different things. So a good example is the Human Development Index, which aggregates uh, income as one dimension, but also uh, longevity, so uh, life expectancy and uh, education. One issue with uh, these composite indices is that they have to aggregate the dimensions using some weights, and the weights are uh, not always very clearly defined or defended, and they cannot guarantee that they reflect individual or social preferences. So that's one, one of these methods. The, the second one uh, we mentioned was uh, the one with uh, uh, dealing with subjective well-being measures, which can be uh, obtained directly from questionnaires. How satisfied are you with your life as a whole these days? Uh, Craig, uh, could you give me a number? Uh, so this is the kind of question that you have in these in these questionnaires. Um, so it's hard to answer these questions, but somehow people manage to answer these questions. And that gives us a, a sort of direct measurement of the final outcome in terms of well-being without a uh, need to dissect its components and aggregate them. It's already done by the respondents of the questionnaire. So that also uh, partly solves the, the issue of preference change, because people will give a number before the change of preferences and after the change. That will still be a number describing how satisfied they are with their lives. However, one issue with these measures is the heterogeneity of individual assessments. 
which can distort comparisons over time and across individuals. To be more specific, imagine an individual A who may rate their life less, less favorably than B rates theirs in terms of um, satisfaction, even though A would not accept trading their position for Bs, right? So the apparent contradiction between their preferences and the scores they give to their life, maybe because they have different uh, references when they choose a number, um, one may be more difficult to satisfy than, than the other. So the, the third approach uh, that uh, we want to introduce is uh, so-called preference-based because it relies on, on preferences, but it still measures uh, people's well-being in a sort of objective measuring rod, namely income. So the equivalent income is uh, the particular example of a preference-based approach we want to show. And uh, let me uh, explain with the graph here. So you have two dimensions on this graph. The horizontal axis is income, the monetary aspect, and the uh, vertical axis describes some non-monetary aspect of quality of life. Let's call it Z. And so what you do in that case is that you choose a reference level for, uh, for Z. And once you have chosen this uh, reference level, you will look for the uh, intersection between people's indifference curve and the line that uh, the flat line that corresponds to this reference level. So if an individual, for instance, is at A, that's the level of income and the level of Z for this individual, you can ask the question, what would be the level of income for this individual that would give the same satisfaction to this individual, but in the case in which he would enjoy the reference level for Z? So this particular level would be uh, this um, equivalent income level here. And you can do the same for individual at B here or the individual at C. So you see, in, if you compare A to B, A is better than B in both dimensions. And unsurprisingly, you'll see that the equivalent income is higher for A than for B. In the comparison between B and C, it's less obvious because C is better in terms of income, but less good in terms of Z. And the question is, well, uh, what, what dominates? What effect dominates? That depends on preferences. And so the, the equivalent income uh, will take account of preferences. So in this case, with these preferences, we see that B is actually on a higher indifference curve. And so uh, that means that we should have a higher equivalent income if we want it to respect individual preferences. And that's the case. That's what we obtain here. The equivalent income is higher with B than, than with C. So here is an example of an applied uh, study of uh, the effect of the, of the transition that uh, takes account of income and health uh, measured in terms of life expectancy. And you see the cost of the transition uh, in terms of income with the light blue and the, uh, the cost if you incorporate the health co-benefits due to uh, improvements in life expectancy, in particular due to, to reduction in air pollution. And you see that in most countries, there is a difference. So the cost is less, uh, is less important if you take into account the health improvements. Um, and this is particularly clear for the emerging economies where you have a lot of air pollution uh, currently, like China uh, and India. Now, let's come back to the issue of uh, changing preferences that Craig already uh, described. Um, this approach of the equivalent income is um, technically at least uh, capable of handling the question of heterogeneous preferences and therefore of changing preferences. Um, once a reference price system has been chosen and references also for the non monetary dimension, each individual will calculate how much income they would need under the reference price system and the reference uh, Z, uh, quality of life, to feel as good as their current state. Okay, And uh, this calculation whatever people's preferences, whether they change or not, will always respect at the time of calculation, will respect the individual's personal preferences. And the results can be compared across individuals or across time, as we did uh, in the graph that illustrated the, the concept. And this approach also solves the issue of uh, path dependency. Um, however, the comparison results are quantitatively and qualitatively sensitive to the choice of the references, uh, and especially the reference prices. And so this calls for uh, cautious and reasoned choices of such uh, reference prices. We won't have the, the space and time to explain more about that here, but uh, this is a potentially uh, important issue. So now let's give you some conclusions and over to you, Craig, to uh, deliver the yes. conclusions. Thank you. So time to sum up. 
So first of all, um, let's stress the fact that um, living standard of living indicators remain essential in the future years because uh, we count on them to the measurement of some component of well-being. Of course, not all components, not all dimensions, but at least the monetary dimension. And they should, in fact, capture effects related to income and prices. However, we've, we've seen that there are some issues. Um, one uh, main concern is uh, the fact that quantity rationing through um, public policies regulating consumption will not correctly be captured um, by real income. Uh, some effects uh, that um, uh, are related to stock variations require examining capital accounts and not just real income, because of course, uh, well-being depends not only on income, so flows, but also on uh, assets. Uh, and uh, finally, there's the issue of inflation inequality. Um, and of course, it's always necessary to look beyond uh, the mean and uh, look what, what's going on behind uh, aggre aggregated um, numbers. Um, regarding the more positive aspects of the climate transition, we've seen that there were two main questions. Uh, the first one is the question of non-monetary um, co-benefits. And the second one is uh, the fact that changing preferences can attenuate costs. So if we're looking for messages uh, that are concise, um, we've seen that there are two um, avenues, subjective well-being and uh, equivalent income indicators, which are complementary and can both contribute to uh, practical measures uh, and uh, more concise than dashboards. Um, however, um, let's say that in this work, we've only talked about short-term effects and not long-term. Um, and we do know that uh, many of these effects are expected to be long-term, but uh, this falls under uh, other uh, kinds of indicators, namely sustainability indicators, which uh, could be the topic of another talk, but uh, has not been the topic of this one. And uh, this, uh, this is all for uh, our talk on uh, thoughts of uh, how to measure costs uh, and uh, non-monetary effects of the climate transition and uh, we hope that you have uh, enjoyed it thank you craig thank you all